Hey there, Scoobies. This episode is entitled Angel. Now, what could it be about? It's so cryptic. So the Master is contemplating the fact that the Slayer is taking out all of his minions, despite being strong and careful. Dala asks to be put in the field, but he comments on her personal stake in this. Pun intended. At this point, we are led to believe that Dala's personal interest is in the growing rivalry between her and Buffy. But, as we will later find out, this is not actually the case. He decides instead to send... The three. The three. As an extra sense of foreboding, this is the wiser decision based on the episode's end. At the bronze, Buffy and Willow are discussing a guy, again. When he is around, it's like the lights dim everywhere else. You know how it's like that with some guys? I mean, I thought the males of the species were the ones that had a one trap mind. Oh yeah. Just saying. Okay, I get it. Xander is a massive dork. I get that he is, generally speaking, unattractive to the population at large. Exhibit A. So, what's with Willow's obsession? We get more of Xander and Cordy's banter. Just getting off the dance floor before any biggest boyfriend squashes you like a bug. Oh, so you noticed. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, thanks for being so understanding. Sure. You know, hey, I don't know what everyone's talking about. That outfit doesn't make you look like a hooker. (laughs) That's right, we are only mid-season one, and this right here, despite what anyone says, is bants. And a mild flirtation. Buffy decides to leave, and Angel is acting very stalker-like. Walking down the street, Buffy asks whoever is following her to come out. This is a nice callback to the pilot episode, showing that she does have a sixth sense, despite Giles thinking that she doesn't hone. But you didn't hone. Buffy is accosted by the three, and Angel arrives just in time. They run and get to Buffy's house, just in time for her to let Angel in. A vampire can't come in unless it's invited. Despite being part of 18th century vampire lore, this is the first time this is referenced in the show. Oh no, Angel's hurt. I said, bang. Bang. Bangity bang. Bang, 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 bang. Mm. Joyce comes home to ruin the moment and probably do the first bit of decent parenting I have seen from her so far. Look, I know I do bash on her, but she does subtly lay down the law. I'm going to go to bed and uh, Buffy, I'll say goodnight and do the same. In a moment that I personally deem to be appropriate, without being overbearing. I mean, they're totally going to ignore her, but still. Look, I don't want to get you in any more trouble. And I don't want to get you dead. Or deader. So, uh, oh, two of us, one bed. <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay, so her maths is way off. I, I have no idea who is tutoring her. I heard a rumour that you were the person to talk to if I wanted to get caught up. Oh, I could totally help you out. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Something I think I will end up saying multiple times throughout the series run is not to judge the standards of the 90s by the standards of today. That being said, Buffy is a feminist show, and though Buffy absolutely shows a sense of equality by offering the bed, it seems like the show and audience expectations of Angel is to refuse the offer in order to remain chivalrous. To be clear, I'm just pointing this out, I tend to actually agree with the mentality of chivalry. On that same note, and a marked difference between Angel and Xander, he doesn't try to sneak a peek. Bets on who the Virgin is. Jokes aside, this is where we get another major reveal of Angel's character. Well, what does your family think of your career choice? They're dead. Was it vampires, maybe? It was. I'm sorry. It was a long while ago. So this is a vengeance gig for you. You even look pretty when you go to sleep. Notice Angel's almost stutter here. Technically, he hasn't lied, but he does dodge the question of vengeance. Whether or not audiences on first watch got it or not, they are laying down everything we need to know about Angel. He has never been seen in the daylight, he's strong, knows a lot about vampirism, and he dodges questions about his past and infers that vampires killed his family. It's a classic case of show, don't tell. The next day, Buffy and Willow share looks about him being the perfect gentleman, while Xander has what can only be described as a breakdown. Wake up and smell the seduction. It's the oldest trick in the book. What? Saving my life? Getting slashed in the ribs? Duh. I mean, guys will do anything to impress a girl. I particularly like this discussion because it's Buffy's heart and spirit arguing over love while her mind is more concerned with the danger. Can we steer this riveting conversation back to the events that happened earlier the evening? Bring it back from representation for a moment. How is it you always know this stuff? 
You always know what's going on. I never know what's going on. You weren't here from midnight until six researching it. It grounds us back in the reality that someone put a lot of hours into figuring out what was going on, rather than just magically knowing. No, I was sleeping. Back with the Master, he is educating the Anointed on the affairs of ruling. The three, though thwarted by Buffy and Angel, are still quite the adversary. It's rather apt that the camera pans on the one missing an eye. The themes of vampires being stuck in adolescence, the Master acting immaturely, blinded by his own inability to mature. It's a child teaching a child, or in this case, the blind leading the blind. This will be mirrored again later in the episode. I have little good to say about the training scene other than it's the introduction of the crossbow, so let's move on to Buffy getting home and freaking out over Angel reading her diary. And A doesn't even stand for Angel for that matter. It stands for Ahmed, a charming foreign exchange student, so that whole fantasy part has nothing to even do with you at all. Your mother moved your diary when she came in. I really appreciate this moment of realisation. I did a lot of thinking today. I really can't be around you. And here we get the romantic back and forth, only, you know, at the same time, converging on... Kiss me? There is a lot at play here. The show doesn't explicitly state that this is Buffy's first kiss, but I'm going to take it as such. With this in mind, the first kiss is a core moment in our development and sexual maturity. Buffy is the slayer, and as we are about to find out, Angel is a vampire. The conflicting conversation before is like the representation of the converging parties as they come together. If this was a kiss shared with any other vampire, it would mark a sense of regression, but unlike all other vampires, Angel is different, as we're going to later find out. So this actually marks a step in Buffy's progression. Even if it doesn't seem like it right now. So this is one big revelation for the first season, and of course Buffy is focused on it, mind, heart and spirit. Her inner spirit is still wrestling with it as she still desires him. Angel's a vampire? Conversationally, she knows in her heart what she's meant to do and logically speaking, what's the right thing to do. Angel's a vampire. You're a slayer. I think it's obvious what you have to do. Uh, It is a slayer's duty. I'm not sure if we're yet at the point of metaphor through the use of wardrobe, but I do like that in this moment's chaos... Willow is wearing stripy colours, showing her spirit is a little all over the place. While Xander, who has always been jealous of Angel, is wearing green in this episode. Buffy herself is sporting a leather jacket, which feels a little more Slayer-esque than usual. Back home, Angel is having problems of his own. Last time I saw you was Kimonos. This is a wonderfully subtle reference, as we will find out later in the show, of the last time Angel saw Dala which was during the Boxer Rebellion in China in 1900. Remember Budapest? Now, I've mentioned before that I believe there is a link between Dala's reference and Natasha's in The Avengers. Just like Budapest all over again! And no, it's not that I think Nat and Clint are secretly vampires. Though that would be cool. More so, I take it to be the Bread in my ledger. A time when they were responsible for many deaths. So too is Dala reminiscing on a time when she and Angel had read on their ledgers. Something else very telling about the differences between Angel and Dala is that Angel's reference is to a time when he had a soul, as we later find out, he was attempting to protect. Dala, however, is more concerned with the carnage of an earlier memory. The back and forth between them highlights the tightrope that Angel walks, something we later forget a little, until around mid-season two, that is. I feel just fine. Angel, though good, still feeds on blood, shuns sun, and shies away from crosses. He may have a soul but he is still a demon too. Back at the library, Buffy's mind is focused on research while her spirit pleads with her heart. Dala enacts her plan to get Angel to turn back to them by going after Joyce, while Angel just so happens to be skulking around. Buffy gets home just in time to get the right idea. They get Joyce to the hospital, where we then play the pronoun game. Your friend came over. Just to give the wrong impression that sends Buffy on her mission to kill Angel. Thinking about it, Dala's plan actually relies on a lot of convenient non-conversation for this to actually work. Dala preps Angel for the fight she has sent his way, and we end up at the bronze. Joyce fills Giles in, which in theory should be a plot point that stops Buffy from killing Angel, but as we're about to see, it ends up being a bit more moot. Dala's plan doesn't have the desired effect. Instead of self-preservation, Angel is going for death by cop. Why not? I killed mine. Killed their friends and their friends' children. For a hundred years, I offered an ugly death to everyone I met. But luckily, Buffy asks the right question. 
what changed. What Darla didn't account for, or can't account for, is Angel's level of regret, as she doesn't have the ability to empathise with it. So, plan B. After a rather cheap action sequence, Angel stakes Darla, bringing to an end their long and deep relationship. You know, the one that we only really got told about this episode. I think after this point, the showrunners know that they did Darla dirty. Later down the line, we start to get more flashbacks that will not only fill in more of Angel's backstory, but allows us as viewers to spend a little bit more time with her. The episode ends with Angel and Buffy agreeing to keep their distance. Well, as long as they're not kissing. Angel is an important episode for season one. Whereas Never Kill a Boy on a First Date helps to move the plot forward, this episode focuses more on the characters and their relationships. It's hard for us to root for Angel if we don't know anything about Angel. This also deepens our understanding of him and a little of his history, which in turn shows in his part why he has skin in the game. A little wide. 